Uh, the voice is a bit better tonight than it was this time last week. Uh, it's great uh, to be with you again tonight. Turn with me to uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians. Paul's letter to the Philippians, please. And chapter 3 and verse 18. Thank again to Bertie for uh, giving us the opportunity uh, <clears throat> to take the meeting tonight. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 18. And then we're going over uh, for a few other verses here and there uh, throughout the New Testament. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross. Turn with me now please to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. And it would be good uh, for you all even just to take a little note of these verses and memorize them in your own time at home. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now come back again. I'm making you do a bit of work tonight. Uh, back to Galatians. You'll come through 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and then to Galatians chapter 5, please. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 11. And you'll see the theme of our message for tonight. Galatians chapter 5 and down to verse 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Now just our final reading, please. In Philippians again, come across through Ephesians. And you'll come to the letter of a, to Philippians again. Philippians chapter 2 and just one verse there. And then you can keep your Bible open there. Philippians chapter 2 and down to verse 8, please. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We know the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word. I want to <clears throat> share with you tonight, uh, and I was glad that our brother called out that hymn as we sat down and sang about it. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. I want to bring your attention tonight in the few moments that we have. And I want to refresh your memory. And I want you to come with me and we're going to gaze again at the cross. I was thinking during the week if this was my last message, gospel message that I was ever to preach. If I was never to preach another message on a platform again or in the open air, I wonder what my message would be. And this is the message that I would preach, the message of the cross. It's the greatest and it's the grandest theme that any man could ever speak of. There's no greater theme than the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting that man's ruin came through a tree. You'll remember way back in Genesis, it was beside the tree, it was the tree that Eve took the fruit from. And man's ruin came into this old world through a tree. But thank God there's remedy tonight. And it's through another tree. And we're going to take a look at it tonight. And we're going to say something tonight about the death of the cross. I'm going to say something very briefly then about the offense of the cross. I'm going to say something on passing about the preaching of the cross. And then I'm going to close by saying something about the enemies of the cross. The death of the cross. If there was ever a way to die, crucifixion was a way that no one ever would have chosen. I want you to point in your mind tonight uh, that the death of the cross was a death of suffering. Suffering. You'll remember the Apostle Paul or Apostle Peter said this, that he suffered for us. He suffered. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dear friends, tonight, give me your attention. He suffered. 
I would go as far as saying this tonight, that the Lord Jesus suffered unlike any other man. Peter went on and he said this, he suffered for us. We all know a little bit about suffering tonight in the meeting. We all have our trials and our affliction. But there was never a man suffered like he suffered. And our brother opened the meeting with that lovely verse in 1 Peter. He once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. You remember the cry that you read about in Psalm 22 that left the lips of the Savior. And never forget, dear friends, it wasn't just another man. We get so accustomed to the cross. We get so used to the story. But this wasn't the man. This was the Son of God who suffered. You remember the lamentation that left his lips in Psalm 22. They pierced my hands and my feet. He went on to say, my bones, they look and they stare upon me. Psalm 22 opens with that awesome prayer. He talks about the, the words of my roaring. The roar of a man that suffered. The God man. I tell you tonight, dear friend and child of God, salvation wasn't cheap. We sing about it and we talk about it. We've heard it from Sunday school. But to realize that he suffered for us, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Crucifixion was the pinnacle of man's brutality. There is no more brutal way to die. And it was the Son of God that was nailed to a cross. He suffered for us. You'll know, and you've heard it before, that the five medical wounds were all seen in the Savior's body. There was the incision wound. There was the penetration wound. There was the laceration. You remember, of course, whenever they, they smote the Savior in his face, one after another. 600 Roman soldiers, that tell me, were gathered in that common hall of Pilate. One after another, it says they smote him on the face. You remember, of course, how they scourged him. And they made long their furrows along his back. And then they pierced his hands and his feet. Ah, he suffered. He knew what it was to suffer. You remember Peter in the day of Pentecost. This is what he said to the religious leaders of Israel. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. In other words, Peter is saying this. It took wicked men to do what you did. It took evil men to do what you did to the Son of God. Ye have taken him and with wicked hands have crucified him. And you've slain him. I tell you, it was that woman from Derry, Mrs. Alexander, got a touch of that. When she wrote that lovely hymn, we may not know, we cannot tell the pains that he had to bear, but we believe it was for us. He hung and suffered there. The sufferings, the, the words of my roaring, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There's not a man in the world tonight could explain all that the Savior went through. There's not a man with all his vocabulary and language could explain to us tonight all that the agonies and the sorrows and the suffering of the Savior. Peter summed it up in two words. He suffered. He suffered. Not only was the death of the cross a death of suffering, it was a death of shame. You know, of course, how it says that they mocked him four times. I was reading that this afternoon. Four times, four different times in the trial of the Savior, they mocked him. They derided him. They belittled him. They laughed him to scorn. Hail, King of the Jews. You can see him standing regal in that common hall. The most gracious, most tender man that ever walked the acres of earth. 
the greatest gentleman that ever was. You remember how it says they stripped him. I tell you, and they put him to shame. It says that they stripped him before Herod's men and they put on him a gorgeous robe. That word gorgeous is a white robe. And before Pilate or Herod, there he stands and they deride him and they mock him. Stripped him. Then they take him from Herod's hall over to Pilate's hall and they strip him again. And they take off the gorgeous robe and it says they put on him a scarlet robe. It was there that they put the crown of thorns upon his head. It was there they took the reed and they put it in his right hand to imitate a scepter and they got down on their knees and said, Heal, King of the Jews. I'll tell you greater than that, friends. Not only is he the king of the Jews, he's the king of the world. He said, I could call to my father and he'd have sent me 72,000 angels. Just in one word, a king always has an army. And he had an army. And then they stripped him from the purple robe and they put on him a scarlet robe. And then they stripped him again and it says they put on him his own garments and led him away to be crucified. They stripped him. Have you ever stood before someone stripped? Stripped of your dignity? Stripped of everything that you had? The only thing that the Savior had as he went to the cross, it says they parted his garments. His garments. The only thing they had, he had, they took it from him. Shame. You remember whenever he was on the cross, kneeled there. It says as they passed by, they wagged their heads at him and said he saved others himself he cannot save. And they mocked him and they derided him. God manifest in the flesh. You know what Peter says? When he was reviled, he reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not. How whenever they hurled their accusation, whenever they hurled their mockery and their insults on his face, he never responded. The death of the cross is a death of sorrow, of suffering, and of shame, but I'll tell you something else. It's a death of substitution. Why was he there? Why was the Son of God there? Why did he endure the buffeting? Why did he endure the scourging? Why did he put up with the mocking and the deriding? You know why he was there? Oh, I tell you, dear friends, the very reason for it is in this room tonight. It's for us. This is what the apostle said, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Can you see him there? God manifest in the flesh. He who knew no sin or did no sin. And after men had done their worst to him. Aye, he bare our sins in his own body on the tree. And God poured the wrath upon him in the agony. I tell you, dear friends, he was there in our place. Paul said this, he was made a curse for us. I tell you tonight, dear friends, that touches my heart. And I would fear tonight if you're saved and it doesn't touch your heart, there's something wrong. To think of the love of God, to think of all that he went through at the hands of men, but it wasn't the brutality of men. It was the bruising at the hand of his father. After men had done their worst, listen to the prophet Isaiah, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Ah, it wasn't that man's brutality. It was the bruising of his father on the cross. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. 
We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of, of us all. And as I hear those words, there's one word that would leave my heart tonight. Hallelujah for the cross. Thank God for the cross. Thank God that though we're going down into a lost eternity, thank God that we were born in sin and shaping and iniquity. Thank God while there was no hope for us anywhere else, there was a cross. Thank God for the cross. I tell you, listen to what the apostle said, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And you know, dear friends, it touches our heart again to realize the day that you get saved, the day a man or woman comes to the foot of the old rugged cross, realizing that the Savior died for them, realizing that he took our place and our shame and our suffering and our sin. I tell you, you know what happens the day a man or woman gets saved? The righteousness of God is imputed to us. I tell you, that's big. And so a man or woman that gets saved in the eyes of God is a man that is justified just as if he'd never sinned. Completely washed, forgiven, saved, transformed. All through the cross. The cross. I tell you tonight, isn't that the greatest message the world can hear? The message of the cross. But not only is there the death of the cross, let me say something about the offense of the cross. We read that in Galatians 5 and 11. Paul talked about the offense of the cross. You can talk about everything to anybody and it'll not annoy them. You can tell them about creation, that'll not annoy them. You can even tell them about sin that may not even annoy them, but you talk to them about the cross. There's something rises in the heart of man when you talk about the cross. You stand in the open air and you tell, you see what happens. You can do, bring the sin of the nation up in the street. You can talk to them about the, the state of the nation. You can talk about the problems in the family and even in the land, but the moment that you touch the cross... There's something that rises and rises in the heart of man. There's an offense about the cross. How ah, you maybe say to me, what's offensive about the cross? Well, I'll tell you. At the cross, we see the holiness of God. The holiness of God. I tell you tonight, dear child, in this meeting tonight, if we could see sin through the eyes of God, we would never be the same again. You remember in the Garden of Eden, it was just one sin that separated man from God. You remember how God drew them out of the garden and he put an angel there. That there was a sword at the entrance of the gate that they couldn't get back in. Sin separates from God. You think of all the sins that you've committed over your life. From the moment that you were born, even to tonight. It's been accumulating every day. Sin. I tell you tonight, God hates sin. He hates it. You say to me, Stephen, how do you know he hates it? I'll tell you how you know. Go to the cross. Go to the cross. See what he did with his own son on the cross when he became a substitute for you and for me. You know what a substitute is? Someone that takes your place. And all the wrath of God that was our due upon the Lamb was laid. Took the place. The sinner's place. And the wrath of God was poured upon him. The waves of the billows of God's wrath came upon his son. I say to you tonight in the meeting, if you're not saved, God loves you. But he hates your sin. He hates the sin. You go down into Craig Avon and you find a mother there maybe and her little child has got leukemia and she loves that little baby with all of her heart. She loves it to no extreme. She loves the child but she hates the disease. That's just where you are tonight. He loves you with an unfathomable love but he hates your sin. And so what he did so that mankind could go free. He sent his son down into this old sin-cursed world. And at 33 and a half years of age, he was nailed to an old rugged cross. 
And God the Father laid all of your sin, all of my sin, all the sin of the world upon his Son. And he paid the penalty. He exhausted the price. But you and I could go free. That's the gospel tonight. It's all about the cross. Not only at the cross do you see the holiness of God, you'll see the hellishness of sin. I tell you tonight, dear friend, in the meeting, if you're not saved, your sin will take you to hell. It'll take you down into a lost eternity. It'll take you to the place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. You're holding on to your sin tonight. It's the very thing that will destroy you. Young man in the meeting tonight that's not saved, you want to enjoy your sin. It's the very thing that will damn your soul. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You see the holiness of God. You see the hellishness of sin. Something else you see at the cross. You see the helplessness of man. I tell you tonight, dear friend, if you're not saved, you can't bargain with God. You can't bribe him. You can't buy him over. You can't work your way. You can't pay your way. There's only one way. And that is the way of the cross. The cross. That was the very theme that touched Augustus Toplady's heart when he penned. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Can my zeal no respite? No. Could my tears forever flow? Nothing can for sin atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. I tell you tonight, dear child, whatever you're holding on to, it'll not save you. It'll let you down in the last day. It's like a stick that's ready to break. It'll take you down into a lost eternity. The last hymn of that verse is not... Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. You know the reason why the cross is so important tonight? And the reason why this would be my last message if I knew it was going to be my last opportunity to preach? For there'll never be a soul in heaven except for the cross. You'll never walk the golden streets or meander your way through the mansions in heaven and bump into someone there that has got there another way but the cross. Every single one of us that will be there, will be there, all because of the cross. The cross. It's there you see the holiness of God. It's there you see the helplessness of man. It's there you see the hellishness of sin. I was reading a story today, just before the Iron Curtain fell in Poland. The Prime Minister of Poland, he banned every cross and crucifix in the whole of Poland. He told them to take them off the churches and off the schools and off every factory wall. And there was a bit of an uproar in Poland at that time. And one zealous communist school teacher went into his school in the middle of the night and he pulled every cru- crucifix off the wall and he burnt it in the car park. And whenever the teachers went in and the pupils went in the next day, they were absolutely disgusted. And this at a stage, and there was over three, two thousand, two, two or three thousand young people sat in that school that wouldn't come out. And the chant that they chanted in that school in Poland was this There'll be no Poland if there's no cross. There'll be no Poland if there's no cross. Let me say this to you tonight there'll be no heaven if there's no cross. Ah, you say to me, Stephen, I'm a good man. Indeed you may be, you'll not get into heaven unless you come to the cross. Ah, you say to me, I'm dead on, and you may be, you'll not get into heaven except for the cross. No Poland, no cross, no heaven, no cross. What are you depending on tonight? Ah, if it's not the cross, friend, you're going down to a lost eternity. Not only do we read there about the death of the cross and the offense of the cross, we read a little in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 about the preaching of the cross. Paul, he said that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, 
but unto us that are saved, it is the power of God. I tell you tonight, dear child, in this gathering, it's the greatest message that the world can ever hear. It's the only message that can change the world, is the message of the cross. It's called the gospel. That word gospel is the good news. We live in a day of bad news, but here's good news. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open that all may go in. Where to? At Calvary's cross is where it begins. When I come as a sinner to Jesus. Starts at the cross. Starts at the cross. It doesn't start at the door of a church. It doesn't start when you reform your life or change your ways. It doesn't start whenever you stop smoking and drinking. No, no, no. It starts at the cross. The cross. There was a man who hated the cross. In fact, he went around persecuting men and women that loved it. One day he had an encounter with the Savior himself on the Damascus Road. Totally changed and transformed his life. He was never the same again and never, never will you be if you get saved tonight. But you know what he said? God forbid that I should glory save in the cross. It was the cross that changed me, said Paul. It was the cross, the place where the Savior died, that changed me. I'll never be the same again. All because of the cross. Oh, you know what it says there in 1 Corinthians 1, that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. To the world, the story of the cross is just a fiction. To the world, the story of the cross is just a make-believe. To the world, the story of the cross is just pathetic in their view. But do you see, to the man or woman that's saved, you know what it is? It's powerful. It's the power of God unto salvation. Some things that the cross has power to do that no, nothing else can do. It is power to save your soul tonight. Muhammad can't do that. Karl Marx can't do that. Confucius can't do that. Good works can't do that. Religion can't do that. You can't do that. But the Lord Jesus on the cross can do it. He can save your soul. There's many in this meeting tonight that have been to the cross. And their souls have been saved as a result of what happened that day. What about you tonight? Not only has it got power to save your soul, it has got power to change your life. Do you see what happened on the cross that day? Not only can save a man's soul, but it can change your life. You take me to the hardest man in Ireland tonight. You take me to a man that's soaked and saturated in sin. He can't break it. He's chained. He's bound. He can't shake free of it. Doctors can't do it. Psychologists can't do it. The cross can do it. Indeed it can. And we often quote it in the gospel. He breaks the power of cancel sin. Hallelujah. He sets the prisoner free. He'll set you free tonight if you come. Not only has he got the power of the cross to save your soul and to change your life quickly. The cross is the power to change your destiny. You see, every person in this meeting tonight, we're going down a road, and there's a fork just at the end. At one branch, it turns off to heaven, the other branch turns off to a lost eternity in hell. I don't know what road you're on tonight. You could be going down a road deceiving me and deceiving everyone else in this meeting tonight. You could be living your life under the guise of a false profession. But whenever death comes, whenever you meet the fork in the road, your destiny will be decided. But your destiny can be changed in it just at one place. The cross. The cross. You see, the attitude that you have to the cross tonight will settle your eternal destiny. Big stuff, isn't it? But not only is there the preaching of the cross and the offense of the cross and the death of the cross 
I'll close by saying something about the enemies of the cross. Paul said, I tell you even now in weeping that they're enemies of the cross. Ah, you say to me tonight, I'm not an enemy of the cross, are you not? That word enemy there is the word to resist. To resist. You tell me tonight how many times you've heard it. How many times you've heard the great gospel message of the cross and you've went away and you said not tonight. Next week. Paul says, I tell you, even weeping, they're enemies. Enemies of the cross. You're resisting tonight. Not only is that word to resist there, it's also the word to reject. I don't want anything to do with it. Heard it all before. I've heard it over the years and I've seen men and women saved, but I don't want it. I don't want the cross. I don't want salvation. I don't want to be saved. I don't want to be born again. I don't want to be delivered. I tell you, even weeping, they're enemies. Enemies of the cross. Not only does it mean to resist and to reject, it means to resent. To resent the hate. I wonder, is there anyone here tonight would tell me that you hate it? Hate the message of the cross. I have no other message to give you, friends. Robert has no other message. Bertie has no other message other than the cross. I tell you, even weeping, they're enemies of the cross. What are you going to do with the cross tonight? Ah, you say, I'm not going to do anything about it tonight. Tonight could be your last night. You go out to the door of this assembly tonight being the enemy of the cross for the last time and go out into a lost eternity. It touches my heart and warms my heart to realize the day that I came to the cross with all of my sin, totally undeserving, a child of the devil. The day I realized the man on that cross died there for me, I became a child of the living God, born again by the Spirit. All my past washed out, never to be the same again. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to read you a poem and then I'm going to pray. I want you to listen to this as I read it and then our meeting is over. Are you weary and sad neath the burden of sin? Does it fill your soul with dismay? And to meet the just claims of a sin-hating God... Do you know you have nothing to pay? All your tears and your sorrow will never atone. By your work can you clear away sin. Then turn to the one who can save you alone, to the Savior in confidence cling. He's the one who has come from God's glory above to save you from ruin and loss. For, for he paid the full debt in his own precious blood when he put away sin at the cross. I thank God there's a day he put my sin away. There's a day he put Trevor's sin away. There's a day, there's a day he put my father and mother's sin away and my wife's sin. Let me ask you a wee question. Did he ever put away yours? Be a good night tonight. If you would come to him, this is what it says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. Father, we just bow again at the end of another meeting. And Father, it warms our heart to realize all that thy son went through on Calvary's cross for each one of us. We thank thee that there's not a man or woman, boy or girl in this meeting tonight that's exempt from the love of God. And Father, we thank thee that there's the message of the cross is able to transform lives, is able to save souls, is able to change destinies. And Father, we pray if there's one in our gathering tonight that's not saved, we would pray that they would be brought again to the foot of the old rugged cross. And if there's one that would listen to this message later on, we pray that indeed they'll come to the cross again as a sinner in repentance and bow and ask the Savior into their hearts. 
We ask that thou would take us home to our homes in safety. We ask it in the Saviour's precious and worthy name.